Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Karen Borchard and I'm with Phase 2 Technology and this is the Drupal Marketplace, how what we sell and how we sell it affects the community, our clients in Drupal. Um, so I am gonna moderate this panel today um, with I, our wonderful um, guest. Uh, we have a panel of guests who are all pretty involved in the product space. In Drupal, um, it's a it's a it's a small but growing group of um, group of people who are involved in this space. So we're going to um, get to some questions and then certainly open it up um, for questions. So um, this is Mo Schweitzman from Acquia, um, Seth Brown from Lullabot, and uh, Ryan Srama. Did I get it? Yes, <laughs> from Commerce Guys. Um, and again, I'm Karen, and I'm from Phase Two Technology. Um, so I'm just going to give us a little tiny bit of context and then we're going to get to the panelists so that you can hear what you actually want to hear about. Um, so there's a lot of people talking about products in Drupal, a lot of people talking about it. Um, in DrupalCon London, we had a motion I sat on a um, panel with Robert Douglas um, around the, the very volatile topic of apps and app stores. Um, the distribution summit in San Diego brought a lot of people together talking about business models around distributions that they've built, distributions that they want to build, distributions that don't exist that they want to see, um, and how to, how to make a living with those. Um, and the Drupal Product Summit in Rome brought um, forth the, the idea of this, you know, kind of should there be one marketplace that, you know, rules them all in, in Drupal. And, um, and actually that, that, was, that turned into a, um, a really kind of a difficult discussion. There's a lot of issues that come up, um, a, a lot of issues that come up there and a lot of things that, um, that, that, are, that come up around open source in the community. Um, it's just a really sticky um, problem, really, really tough one. Um, so a lot of questions, how do we build products, how will monetize products ruin the community, um, why is it okay to sell services but not products, should there be a single Drupal app store, I promised I wasn't going to say the word app store today, um, can we make a living with products and does GPL prevent um, successful business model for open source um, products, so a lot, a lot of questions and very, very few answers to some of those things. Um, so really, you know, what, what we've kind of come up with in terms of what we see the challenge being is basically everyone wants to make a good living in this space. That's that's why we're here. We we're able to be at um, this conference today because partly because we make at least part of our living um, in Drupal and in this space. Um, and products are attractive because they offer you a way to build once and sell many times, or that's what you hope, right? Um, so there's so there's an interest in, and, and products are really attractive. But products can feel really proprietary and locked up um, and not so open source depending on how they're built and how they're released, how they're contributed to and how they're used. So nobody wants to harm and sacrifice the community because that's what allows us to make a living in Drupal in the first place. And so that's the question is how do we, how do we solve this challenge? How do we solve this problem? And that's what these guys are going to answer now. So it's going to be great. Um, I'm going to let each of these guys introduce themselves and tell a little bit about, um, we're going to start with just to ask you each um, to tell a little bit about what you do with products um, and what, you know, what, what you're doing with products in this space and what you see as the big challenges. So we'll start there. Um, and we'll start with Mosh. Hi, everyone. My name is Mosh Weitzman, and uh, I work for Acquia. And uh, we have quite a few uh, Drupal products. Um, you might have heard of Drupal Commons. Um, that's a distribution that we primarily manage along with the rest of the community um, for um, intranets and uh, communities. Um, you know, some of the popular uh, Drupal Commons sites um, are eBay and PayPal. There are developer community, communities run on um, Drupal Commons. We have the conference organizing distribution, COD. Uh, and we also have a, a hosting platform and a support platform where we support uh, our products and everyone else's products. Um. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Seth Brown. Um, I am Lullabot's director of operations and, and formerly development manager and sort of director of professional services. So. I get, I get new job titles all the time, but no raises. So, <laughs> And I, I, this was actually going to be Matt Westgate up here, but he, he delegated, so here I am. <laughs> it's good to be the king. Um, so as far as Lullabot goes, uh, we are pr predominantly a services company, as probably most of you know. We started as a training and consulting business and then became primarily a development shop, a services shop. But throughout our existence, we've tried to sort of bootstrap and spin off products. And, and sort of our most successful examples, uh, and there are definitely some unsuccessful examples that you probably haven't heard of, 
Uh, our successful exa examples include um, DrupalEyes.me, which is a learning site for Drupal videos, uh, and then a hosted video platform called Videola.tv, which is actually the foundation for DrupalEyes.me, uh, that basically allows businesses to monetize video on the web. And uh, Videola lets you sort of build a, a Netflix um, on-demand subscription-based platform or an Amazon, you know, sort of rent or pay-per-view system or a, even a Hulu ad-sponsored. Um, and and we, we offer that as a hosted service. So that's kind of where we've, we've ventured in, into uh, products. I'm Ryan Zarama from Commerce Guys. Um, I'm a, my, my title belies how, how I might be a little removed from the discussion here because I'm, I'm the VP of Community Development, which means I don't, actually, I don't actually have to worry about how we make money um, with our products. Um, I am, I've been leading the development of Drupal Commerce, um, which also includes the development of, uh, well, I'll call it a pseudo distribution right now, um, which is called Commerce Kickstart. And I say pseudo because it doesn't do much more than an installation profile. Um, but of course the plans that I just blogged about um, right before the conference involve making this look and function much more like uh, the lovely products that are produced by the guys up here on the stage with me. Um, it's not to say that we, we are ignorant of, of the need to make money um, or to really um, like productize what we offer around the distributions, um, but thus far our primary focus has been on um, increasing adoption and really bringing in people from outside of the Drupal community. Um, and, and using the, the distributions of the products as um, maybe, maybe training templates um, or launch points to, to sort of draw people into using Drupal for the first time and then certainly using Drupal Commerce to build their next e-commerce projects. Um, and then you know, gil building up this, this pool of users that uh, will then become, ideally, uh, customers, paying customers in the future. Great, and you're certainly not removed from this conversation because we're certainly going to talk about community contribution to products. Um, so, and I'm just to, to round it out, um, I am the director of products with Phase 2, and um, Phase 2 maintains um, three main distributions. Um, Open Public, which is a distribution building platform for the public sector and um, for government organizations and nonprofits. Um, Open Publish, which is a publishing platform for um, online news and media. And then Open Atrium, um, which is a collaboration and project management tool um, for um, everyone. So uh, we will, that's, um, those are the distributions that we run and we are, um, we have uh, various um, efforts around those products, but we mainly sell services. We're mainly a services firm and do a lot of work on customizing and building sites upon those products for our customers. So here we go. Okay, so we're going to start actually with that question, um, it, it, which is, you know, most most of us here are from services backgrounds. Um, and so I guess we'll, and I'm, I'm going to ask these questions and, and ask one or two of these guys to answer each one, and then we'll um, open it up at the end for, for your many questions. So get that, you know, whole huge list of questions ready. So you can stand up there. Um, so we'll, we'll start with this one, um, and we'll start with Seth, actually. Um, so for, coming from a service background, you know, what, what makes you know, the alternatives attractive um, in terms of, or why, why look beyond services at all? If, if you're in services and you're, and you're doing that, why look beyond that? Sure. Great question, Karen. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I come from a services background. Um, I was actually with a company called Blue Tent Marketing for, for six years that's, that's well represented here in the audience, and we were primarily a services firm. Uh, and then I came to Lullabot, and we're primarily a services firm. I would say that uh, probably 85% of our revenues come from services and not from our products. So our products are still not necessarily the lion's share. But, you know, what are the, the cons of services? Well, you know, basically it comes down to selling hours, right? If you sell an hour, you can never sell that hour again. There's, there's no leverage. Um, and as this marketplace is maturing, there's more and more firms doing uh, Drupal services, and it gets harder and harder to differentiate. And I think you know the laws of supply and demand kick in, and, and you sort of have this commoditization of services. Uh, there's a downward pressure on rate. Uh, you know, it gets harder to do value billing. Uh, there's a story that that I always love about you know value billing, which is you know there's a guy with the Rolls Royce, and uh, he you know can't get it to run, and so he's he's kind of you know, exhausted every mechanic in town, and there's this specialist, he's, you know, that's far away, but 
apparently this guy's the best. So the guy gets his, some friends and they roll the Rolls Royce or they tow it over to this, this mechanic and the mechanic comes out, takes a look, you know, pulls out a rubber mallet, opens the hood, hits the engine, the thing starts up again and seems to be working fine. You know, and, and the mechanic comes and says, okay, that'll be $1,000. And the guy's like, $1,000? You just hit it with a rubber mallet. You know, and, and he says, well, you know, it's a dollar for the labor and 999 for knowing how, where to hit it. And, uh, you know, I think that's the way to sort of make a services business go. But it's, it's difficult as there's more competition in the marketplace, um, you know, to, to, to continue to sustain those prices. So uh, products let you, you know, leverage your work and, and sort of build once, sell multiple times. I think that's also a bit of a fable because there's, you know, all kinds of things, you know, that go with servicing a product and having an SLA and wearing a pager and all that fun stuff. But I think that's where sort of the intrigue of, of being a product business comes from instead of a services business. But we're definitely trying to not throw out the baby with the bathwater. All right. Yeah, yeah, why don't you chime in on that one? All right, I'll chime in. Uh, best I can. Um, <clears throat> so Acquia um, doesn't do a lot of professional services. That's definitely not a focus for our company. Um, it's there uh, for some customers who need it, but um, we definitely are focused more on um, cloud hosting and on support. Um, and we also have some SaaS products, um, Drupal Gardens. Anyone can go there and start up a Drupal 7 website. Um, and a new product we just announced called Enterprise Gardens uh, for large enterprises who need to spin up um, dozens or hundreds of sites um, according to a, a templated Drupal distribution. Um, and we will host that and support that. Um, so there's kind of hybrid um, services and products. You know, I, I would consider um, SaaS businesses to be somewhere in the middle of that. Um, it's kind of a, it is also another sweet spot for Drupal. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, SAS. Yep, great. Um, so this is the, what everybody wants to know, right? Uh, what are the what are the ways that people have found to successfully um, monetize their their products uh, in this space? We're gonna, oh no, we're gonna start with Ryan on this one. I get to choose. The way that the way that we've monetized is through training. Um, and through support. We actually have a support agreement with Acquia where we, we support Drupal Commerce websites in partnership with their, their normal support uh, team. Um, and so that was an immediate way to monetize things without having to actually dive into SLAs and pagers. Well, I guess I'm not wearing one, but uh, <laughs> okay, somebody is. Um, so th that, that was, that was the, the initial obvious way. Um, and then um, it's, it's not sustainable long term, but there, there's also the, the fact that We've been building Drupal Commerce um, thanks to client money. Um, so we, we've monetized the build process in a sense. It's, it's, it's been self-funded and it's, it's kept the rest of the team busy as well. So um, that's, that's about where we are right now. Certainly not where we intend to stay. Yep. Yeah. Great. Should we also uh, ooh, save the iPad? Yeah. Good call. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Depend on my teammates here. Um, we should also define SaaS. Like, I don't know if we're, we're throwing it around as a buzzword and sort of taking it for granted, but it's, everybody knows it's software as a service. You want to talk a little bit about SaaS and that, that approach? Uh, sure. Uh, let's try not to electrocute ourselves let's in the process. Let's not electrocute ourselves in the panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, software as a service um, is all about uh, you no longer have to do the hassle of installing your own Drupal. Someone does that for you and they give you a URL and you have a Drupal site and you're off to the races. Um, and so I mentioned Drupal Gardens uh, is our first attempt at that. Um, it's free, go ahead and check out uh, Drupal if you don't know much about Drupal. Um, and uh, there are, it, it's very much a premium, a premium model there, okay? So you upgrade to a paying version of Drupal Gardens and you get more features on your garden site, okay? Um, and you know, the, the whole freemium SaaS model, um, I think was innovative a few years ago. It's actually um, de rigueur now, um, where you go to a website, you get something for free, you start paying 10 bucks a month, you get a little more, 20 bucks a month, you get a little more. Um, it's a great model. Uh, it's a subscription model, which is all about recurring revenue, which is another problem with services, is that it's often one-time revenue. Um, so you know, that's, 
that's kind of how we're trying to monetize this thing was with lots of subscription revenue. Great, um, and you know, like like Ryan um, at phase two, that's that we do primarily a lot of our work through services work. So um, we use the distributions as the base uh, to start building for clients, and um, I, I think actually Acquia uses the term a lot um, accelerators for distributions and that's um, it's a good word for it um, they they help get us off the ground faster um, and help execute our projects faster um, and then we are able to we've you know, kind of built a reputation in the verticals where we work with those products. So in some ways, um, we monetize um, almost in, in lead generation and marketing, um, but then we also build uh, with the services and customizations on top of that. So um, certainly, you know, that's certainly services revenue. It's it's not, um, you know, dedicated, you know, build once and 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 monetize forever product revenue, uh, but it is it is how we've how we've monetized on on the products and how we fund continuing to build them. All right. Um, so this is a question that comes up a, a lot um, in in this um, in this space. You know, the when you're managing a product like this, it's open source. Um, it's sometimes funded through your client's work, um, and it has it's it's probably not the exact same model and road mapping process that you would use if you were just building a product um, straight out of the gates and and you know building a little company around a product. Um, let's start with um, Seth on this one. Um, how have you found um, that you manage the product roadmaps for something like Drupal Eyes Me or Videola differently um, because of its open sourceness? Mm -hmm. um, well, it basically takes some options off the table. Um, so Videola is is a platform, and we give it away for free on GitHub. Anybody that has the knowledge to leverage a, a complex Drupal distribution can go and download Videola and host it themselves. Um, so we have to figure out another way to sort of make money in a sense. And, and the way that we've done that obviously is to create a hosted solution for Videola. Um, and then to sort of, we call it the special sauce, but add components to, to that um, that you can't get with the free distribution, such as iOS apps, Android app, apps, Roku apps, you know, a professionally implemented theme. Uh, CSS code is, is not covered under the GPL. Um, so, so there's certain things that you can sort of uh, legally, you know, it, the, the truth is you could sell anything to anybody uh, under the GPL, but they have the right to then take the source code and give it to anyone else. So if you're trying to protect something uh, as somewhat proprietary, uh, you have to figure out, you know, things that you can create that you can sort of um, sell as a product uh, without distributing. Um, getting a little sort of going all over the place here, but how do you manage your product roadmap differently? Um, you know, I don't know. I think with, you can pretty much go with a classic SaaS model. The only thing that we wouldn't do, uh, a lot of, uh, like Assembla, I think, for instance, which is a project management system, will let you pay a lot to host the software on your own servers, you know, to basically have the enterprise version of Assembla and host it internally. And that's important for a lot of clients, like we have a client, Martha Stewart, and they can't have their code base on GitHub. They have to have it behind their firewall. And there's a lot of enterprise companies like that. So Assembla, which is basically software as a service, is able to offer yet another tier where they actually give you the software. So they've, they've essentially distributed it at that point. Um, but they're protected because it's, they're not dealing with the GPL in the way that we are. And we don't do that with Videola. You know, we don't allow a company to basically host Videola on their own, uh, at least not the enterprise version. Um, the, the version that's a free distribution is certainly out there openly, but uh, the one that has all of uh, the sort of code that we've written to serve video and deliver video, uh, we, we keep to the hosted option. So. Yeah. Is it the second the picture? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that, that we do is we just don't put, um, it, well, I don't say we don't. It's, it's a lot harder to put dates on releases. It's a lot harder to put dates on features. Um, because in a sense we're, we're dependent on Drupal and Drupal's you know dates are it's, it's released when it's ready um, and so so that can make it a lot harder to have a dependable product lifecycle um, and and additionally like if, if you're trying to include and involve other people from the community in the development of the product which we want to do that brings its own challenges um, if I was just paying somebody to write the shipping module for example I would write them a spec and they'd go and produce a shipping module that does exactly what we needed it to do um, but instead, you know, it wasn't in our initial 1.0 roadmap, 
um, but we wanted it to come quickly, and so some guys from uh, Copenhagen took, took that and, and sort of ran with it. Um, and that made it great for flat rate shipping if, you know, that's all you needed, mm -hmm. um, was some sort of European flat rate shipping that kind of solved their problems. But, um, you know, with, with e-commerce being so diverse and having such a, like, wide, wide feature set, and, and even, like, every feature has this wide sub-feature set, um, it, it wasn't abstract enough. And so then we had to then ex sort of extend our, our shipping roadmap to include a rewrite. Yeah. Um, and, and then you have to do that along with the developer. And, and like the last thing I want to do is demotivate somebody that's, that's just contributed a bunch of code to the project. Um, so th there's, there's the timing and, and the sort of um, personnel or community management that, that you have to do uh, to make sure that, that you still have good buy-in um, and you're not being hindered at the same time by the open source nature of your foundation. Um, so I in my mind, um, being an owner of a distribution is a, a pretty interesting spot to be in. Mm -hmm. um, you get to have final decision on product roadmap, uh, which is great. And at the same time, you have lots of people uh, giving input, giving code, and you get to give back to the community um, you know, parts of your roadmap and parts of what you build. Uh, you know, in a sense, um, each one of us who runs distributions is like a Dries, right? He's the Drupal core distribution owner, um, and we're all doing similar kinds of things with our own projects. And you know, we're really excited when someone else, uh, you know, brings the voting API module up to the new features we need. And if that's not happening quick enough, maybe we can sponsor someone to do that, um, or we do it ourselves and give it back. So you know, there's. There's lots of um, pluses for um, being part of an open source project and running a distro that uses all the contrib parts of Drupal. Yeah, there, there is. I think um, there's, a, there's another side of that, too, um, that's really the, the, that we find challenging. Um, I think this is challenging to distributions is that the other part about being a, a distribution um, owner, uh, which is an interesting word for it, or distribution, you know, maintainer of something that is, you know, the community code. I, I've sometimes said that um, our distributions are, are actually one of the most closed things that we do um, at phase two. We, you know, we, we work, maintain a lot of modules. Um, we maintain a lot of code out on Drupal.org. Um, the distributions are actually the things that it are the, is the part that gets the, the least amount of contribution um, and the most amount of people um, asking, you know, when's the next release coming? We need a day. We need to know what feature are in it. We need to know, um, you know, we need to, <laughs> we need our free software and we need it now. Um, and, and, that's, and that's a challenging place to be in too. Um, be, and, and distributions kind of lend themselves to that way because they do um, often have, you know, a bit of a brand around them and a bit of a, a they, you know, they can have the feel of something a, a bit more proprietary. Um, and, so, and so bridging that and finding the way to get people to really contribute into that and, and finding a way to to be a, a leader and you know for the vision and the roadmap for the product without being you know so all encompassing that you're the only ones that are that are doing anything with it um, is a is an interesting balance I think in in this space. Um, I, we've talked about this a little bit, but um, how does GPL affect what what you sell and what you and how you build your products? Anyone? It doesn't. <laughs> All right, I'll try to be a little, okay. <laughs> a little more verbose than that. Um, okay, so uh, you know, a as Seth said, the GPL takes a few options off the table, um, but uh, you know, there's still a whole universe of ways to make money with your distribution. Um, so I think that there are plenty of good options there, including the SaaS one that I talked about before, um, the services-based model that Karen mentioned. Um, so yes, it, it affects, and um, it affects positively, positively and negatively, like I was saying. You get contributions from the community that uh, you didn't have to fund yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's actually helpful in that it takes off of the table the, this idea that maybe we can package up code and sell it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it sort of it, it helps narrow your focus right off the bat because um, that like that problem how do you package up GPL code and distribute it and support it in a community has already been solved. Mm -hmm. It's been solved by Drupal.org and by GitHub and these other things. So so there's not like uh, we don't we don't have to worry about chasing money in actually 
facilitating the distribution of, um, of a module. So what we sell won't end up being that. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that there can't be a valuable service around curating and rating and whatever else you're doing to, 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 to repackage these features and sell them. But like, like, like as a baseline, like it's made us as a community better at collaborating and distributing. So we don't have to really worry about those types of things to sell. We can focus on the services and the training videos and the network subscriptions and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Great, great, thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm actually going to leave this one with Ryan for a minute because it sounds like you've had quite a lot of success with this. Um, how have you have you had some success in getting community contributions to your product, and how have you how have you done that successfully? Mosh has contributed to Drupal Commerce. <laughs> 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 yes, I think you have one, um, but yeah, two maybe. Uh, well, a few more coming down the pipe, I think. Um, What's, what's great is that um, we've solved the need, and a lot of people have that need, mm -hmm. and a lot of those people are technically competent, people that want to give back when they can. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so Drupal Commerce um, has attracted a lot of people that are either from Drupal shops uh, that just had a need for e-commerce and then were able to contribute back to um, the project, or there, there are now Drupal shops that are just basing themselves around building Drupal Commerce sites. Yeah. And so go those guys have become active contributors. Um, and how do you encourage them to, to continue to continually actively contribute back and not just build with your product and then, and then not contribute what oh they're yeah, doing so, back? So, um, well, uh, some of these guys, like, they're, they're trying to make a name for themselves for the first part. Like, like th they want to be known as a company that contributes to Drupal Commerce and, and has got their module featured in Commerce Kickstart. So, so, so just contributing in itself is attractive to them. Um, so you don't really have to try. Mm -hmm. and, and then a lot of what we're doing is utility. Um, like, like you're not going to, you, you're not really going to win any friends or business by keeping a payment gateway module closed. Um, the, the only reason that, that they should consider not making it open is if, like, it's, it's insecure. Uh, and then maybe they should just, like, not be writing their own code. Um, <laughs> but, like, like there's, there's, no, there's no incentive right now in Drupal Commerce world for people to keep their stuff private. Um, in fact, the, the bigger challenge is just like once these guys start getting traction in their market is actually making sure they have the time to give back. Um, and so, so personally, I try to make myself extremely available um, to guys. And, and a lot of commerce guys will help co-maintain these projects. So our contributors can put the address book module that they developed online. And then we can then help them you know, re you know, polish. Or I came in and helped with the shipping module to, to abstract it and make it more generally useful. Um, so, so it's been... Uh, Maybe, maybe in some sense a hyperactive engagement of the developer community um, to make sure that, that they know when they're giving back, it's, it's both appreciated and they're going to get help. They're not just going to be stuck with this module that they have to maintain and hate it. Mm -hmm. um, and so like thus far, even to Drupal Commerce, we've had you know, over 100 contributors, and many of those have a dozen or more patches that they've given back because they, they know, like they can totally understand the success that this is going to compound, not just for their next project, but for everybody else that they're also benefiting from. Mm -hmm. So... Um, as, as with Drupal, it's a really easy value mm -hmm. proposition, I think. Yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, I, for Lullabot, I feel like, again, this is, Ryan mentioned that this is sort of a problem that Drupal has already solved. You know, how do, we get, how do we get open source contributions? So what we try to do with our products is make sure that we hew to a site building approach as much as possible. So as little custom code as we can ends up in the actual product. And then whatever else is custom often will contribute back as a module. Like Lullabot, for instance, has done a lot of the work on the Uyala module, uh, which is, uh, Uyala is a, a video backend uh, content provider. And so we've actually done a lot of work on that module, contributed back to the community, and then of course we use that in Videola as you know, a, a tool to plug into a particular content provider. So by getting that stuff all back out into Drupal.org, you know, we can leverage those contributions. Uh, and then the only other answer I'd have is, is GitHub uh, definitely makes contribution a lot simpler. Um, so if we want people to, to, let's say, come in and help us with actually upgrading the Videola code base, um, let's say we want some nice Samaritan to come along and upgrade it from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, you know, if we put it on GitHub, it, that makes their lives a lot easier um, to sort of work with the distribution as a whole. So. 
Okay, this is this is one of the. This, I sort of addressed this a little bit earlier and discussed it from our perspective, but um, and and it, it goes into the roadmap question um, that of a little bit of you know how do you handle the free software customers who are looking for upgrades or support or fixes um, on their timelines and on their um, for their needs. You know you, you certainly want to want to really encourage people to be building with your distributions. Obviously that's what you know or or your products. Um, that's why you have them and that's why you build them. Um, but how do you how do you face the challenge? of um, the fact that you're sometimes funding them through your own projects you have your own services work and and you have your own um, timelines that are that are that you're facing um, how do you guys deal with that let's see we'll start with Mersh. that's a good plan okay. um, well there's different parts of the answer I guess the the really short one is you deal with it with thick skin um, <laughs> yes <laughs> there's, uh, there's, there is always going to be a class of open source enthusiast who wants more for free faster, right? Um, and you know they're just like mosquitoes. You sort of have to cope with them. Um, and um, there's not much more to say about it. Now there, there's a whole other class of people who um, isn't quite so entitled. Um, but they do feel entitled to at least hear from you every so often, right? So I think communication is a large part of the pro uh, uh, you know the challenge here. Um, if you are an owner of a distribution, Drupal Commons, um, Open Publish, uh, and you want people to use it and be happy with it, you have to tell them what you're working on um, and what you know when the next version might be coming out, and you know what the current challenges are for this product and. So you build a community there and you talk to them, okay? And I think um, the members of the panel here have been quite good at this. Um, but definitely, you know, frequent blogging is a big part of satisfying the free software customer. Anyone else? That nails it. That nails it? All right, good. Good job, Mosh. <laughs> um, how do products overall affect your um, company's overall business plan? I mean, it, as a, you know, well, about to, uh, you know, we have services, products um, in the mix there. How does how does it how does the concept of products affect what you guys are doing in terms of um, where you spend your time, who you hire, what you do, and what your strategy is as a company? Yeah, that makes sense. Sure, I can start with that one. I mean, the short answer is it's a big for us. Products are a big kick in the nuts. Um, it's you know we we bootstrap them uh, with our <laughs> services team. And so we're basically saying, you know, okay, we're not going to work on this highly profitable services work. We're going to devote resources to this product and to its future promise. So it's, it's really uh, challenging to bootstrap products. Uh, it's funny because, you know, we have a culture of sort of bootstrapping and spinning off products. It's very much along the, the 37 Signals philosophy of sort of selling your byproducts. Um, and, and you know, creating things in house, and then and then making products out of them. And Jeff Robbins is is sort of a brilliant vision visionary, and uh, you know is always coming up with ideas for products. And why don't we do this? And oh, ah, that's shiny! You know, let's go over here. And meanwhile, it's like we're trying to run the core services business, and it can be very difficult. And there's moments where it it feels sort of desirable to maybe take the route that I think both Commerce Guys and Acquia have, have taken, which is to get some funding, you know, to get funded as a startup uh, and, and maybe spin off the product as its own entity. Uh, but so far we've been sort of, you know, just coping with the turbulence um, and the impacts and the disruptions. But it, it has a real effect on my developers' morale and, and how much and how long they have to work. Um, and it's tough. And, and so far we've done it based on the fact that there's a lot of belief in our products and in sort of, you know, making our own dog food um, at Lullabot to eat. And, uh, you know, I don't know that there's a great answer uh, if you're going to try to bootstrap. Um, you know, there's, there's really not a lot of ways to insulate. The only thing that we've tried to do is to sort of create structures within Lullabot to insulate those products as much as possible. Um, and we've tried to narrow our focus because you know, again, we have, a, we have a visionary at the helm, so there's all kinds of ideas floating around. So we've created processes uh, where we sort of have to prove the product's concept in business plan form, you know, before Lullabot is willing to take it on and throw resources at it. Um, and, you know, that, that's helped a lot to sort of call the chaos a little bit. 
And I'd say say that it helps them to have expertise um, because that's what you can charge a lot of money for, and uh, then you're freeing up developer time. So I know I know that like Lullabot, they're experts, and so they they actually have more money coming in that they can then set aside developers if they need to to develop the products like Drupalize Me or um, whatever else you have in the kitchen. Um, and at, at Commerce Guys, we made the decision very early on that I wouldn't be um, I, I wouldn't be a consultant. I wouldn't be doing uh, billable client work. So very rarely am I actually pulled into um, actually generating revenue for the business. I'm, I'm just focused on Drupal Commerce and on com Commerce Kickstart. And, and again, that, that affected the, the raise strategy. The, the idea is that um, from my experience with Ubercard, you can't, you can't build this stuff and then have the rest of your time taken up by clients because clients will always want more time. And if they're the ones that are keeping your business going because you're the one servicing them, then you just won't be able to have time to work on your products. So we had to set me aside full time and then we're looking to hire more people to set aside full time to do product development. Um, one, one of the first things that we, we got going after we took the, the recent raise um, was set aside a product team in Paris that's working on with me on the commerce kickstart sort of relaunch that we're looking at um, to actually make it more attractive to the outside community. So our business plan, why we've raised money and how we charge our clients um, is all revolving around um, what we hope to do with Drupal Commerce and how we hope this, this product to be central to everything else that we do and build around it. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna make you stay on the on the I'm gonna stay with Ryan for a minute, um, just because you just discussed the kind of venture capital question, and I think it's one that a lot of people ask us about um, uh, in products. Um, we have you know outside investment in in, in a couple of these companies here, um, you know. Commerce guys, I think it's probably you know pretty big news that just just did a raise. Yeah. Um, you know we and we also do have some bootstrapping. Phase two has never taken investment for products, so there's certainly different ways to do it. Um, but I, one of the questions that I think we hear a lot is does does outside investment create any pressure to be you know less open sourcey with your with your products, or does it create um, any interesting dynamics in the open source um, aspects of product development and product development in Drupal? Yeah, I, I guess I, I should start by saying it certainly can, mm -hmm. um, but when you're seeking investors, you're, you're vetting them as much as they're vetting you. And so you're not going to take investment from a company that's going to put that negative pressure on you if, if they really understand and if you really understand how the open source culture in the community really drives your business forward. Um, and so with our, with our recent raise, it was um, a combination of three investors. One was our existing investor, um, ESIE, a French um, fund for entrepreneurs. Another was an e-commerce fund called Alvin Capital. But the third was one that you may have heard of called Open Ocean, um, which was founded by the guys that made a mint selling MySQL. Um, so, you know, Monty was part of our vetting process. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys are in the room looking at how we're engaging our community. And we were actually doing some, uh, uh, I don't know, if, I think it was our technical due diligence or something. How do we respond to bug reports and manage our issue queue and stuff? And he saw an issue that was like two years old and somebody had promoted it to critical without me knowing about it. <laughs> and so he's like, why do you have a critical bug in your queue that you haven't dealt with yet? Like, oh my goodness. Wow. I'll go take care of it right now. Because <laughs> um, they, really, they really understand, the, the, you know, they really understand that, that the community drives their business. And, and, and in a sense, it's the community that made us attractive. Mm -hmm. um, if if uh, Drupal.org didn't have usage statistics that showed that 10,000 people were using Drupal Commerce, we wouldn't have um, received the valuation that we did. We wouldn't have uh, received the interest from these investors that we did. Um, but, but to them, we were attracted because we not only had a good product in Drupal Commerce with Commerce Kickstart, uh, but we had a solid community of people that were enthusiastic about it and helping us to build it and that we were engaging with positively and really benefiting from and benefiting them in return. Um, so it's, it's really just about choosing who you're actually investing with. And I think the same is true for Acquia that their, their investors get their strategy. They get that, that Dries retains sole ownership of the trademark and that Dries um, you know, has, has, you know, it, a full engagement rights with the community to, to build this how he sees fit. Mm -hmm. um, so that the same, you know, it's true for us. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that they don't want to see a return on their investment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still gonna, gonna, going to drive the way that we move forward. But they actually challenge us to be more open mm -hmm. about our product plans than, than we have been thus far. Okay. Um, so I, I guess that's a, that's a good story. I don't know if there's a bad story up here, yeah. honestly. But mm -hmm. I'll let, uh, do you know about this? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, ours is a good story also. Uh, Acquia has had uh, several rounds of funding, um, and you know all of those rounds have been, um, the investors have understood and even promoted, like Ryan was saying, us to do more with the community. Um, you know, there's a real understanding among our investors that um, Acquia is just riding the Drupal wave, 
and it is very, very, very important for Drupal to succeed in order for Acquia to succeed. And you know that's the reason why Acquia um, puts a lot of money into Drupal Core and Drupal Contrib. Um, <clears throat> you know they pay uh, Angie Byron full time to just manage community issues um, and move Drupal.org forward. Uh, and Dries's time to fly around the world and talk about Drupal. And Alex Bronstein now is full time working on Drupal 8. Um, and you, you may see more people working on Drupal 8 from Acquia. And so um, all of that is done uh, not so much for our benefit, it's a little bit for our benefit, but more for everyone's benefit so that we can ride that raising tide. Um, so yeah, I really don't see a conflict of interest there between the uh, venture people and Drupal. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Um, all right, so now we're going to open it up for your questions. Um, we have about 20 minutes. Yep, about 20 minutes. Um, so we'd love to hear your questions or if you'd like more clarification or explanation on something. Um, we'd love to hear from you. There's a microphone right there in the middle. Don't go all at once. Slow down. Calm down. There you go. Yes, you, sir, in the back. So the, the question is one of, of product strategy. Have we considered um, monetizing through a hosted um, version of Drupal Commerce? Um, and and what, I, what I would say is I was, I was actually talking with, um, with the guy earlier on the way here about the fact that because we built our business around expertise, around consulting, we're, we're really servicing the higher end of the market. So the people that we have on staff that we have to continue to afford to have on staff um, are, are servicing larger clients with, with their own set of needs. And, and it would be great to take Drupal Commerce mass market, um, but it's a different trajectory from where we've been going. That's not to say it doesn't need to happen. Um, I think that, that if we want to serve all those people that aren't doing a million dollars or more in business a year from their website, um, that there has to be some simple hosted solution because they just don't have the budget um, to, to pay us um, what, what, would, what makes sense for us as a business to, to stay alive. Um, so consider it definitely. Um, considered all competing with Drupal, Drupal Gardens, no, I'd, I'd much rather partner with somebody like them. Um, but but I, I think it's a great idea, but it's also a very crowded space. Um, I, I can name a half dozen off the top of my head of, of companies that are all doing that already and have already set the bar at like $9.99, $15.99 a month for that kind of service. Um, and so that would take you know a whole round of investment on its own to build something that could compete immediately, I think. Yeah. I have a question for you guys. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for what I talk about. Um, you mentioned about uh, more and more companies uh, just uh, going to the Drupal business, so it's more uh, competition now. Mm, like I have a question about a startup new company in the Drupal business. Do you guys have any good suggestion to the startup business like this one? Sure, um, that's a great question. So what would I uh, advise somebody who's sort of coming into the Drupal uh, ecosphere and wants to start a business as far as strategies? Um, for one thing, I would say don't, don't sell Drupal necessarily. And, and what I mean by that is you know, Drupal, the tool, the technology, uh, it would be sort of like your, your contractor you know, selling you on the, the saw he was going to use or the hammer he was going to use. I would say find a business problem that you can solve, a vertical that you know very well, uh, and then work to provide solutions for that particular business vertical and use Drupal as a tool to make that happen. But the idea of sort of putting up your shingle and saying, hey, we're a, we're a Drupal business, you know, come to us if you need help with Drupal, I feel like to some degree that ship has already sailed. Um, there are a lot of, it's a pretty competitive market and there are a lot of established brands in that space. So it's harder to, to get there. On the other hand, right now, uh, you know, we're seeing an unbelievable uh, sort of demand, I think, all of the companies and shops. And so everybody's hiring and acquiring. And, and there is a lot of business for, there's a lot of small to medium-sized websites that are, are not getting built because people can't find providers to do that type of work. So I, I do think there's some space there. Uh, it's probably a little bit more difficult if you want to service, you know, large, large enterprise level clients, um, you know, to, to sort of come in that way. 
Um, I guess one other suggestion for aspiring entrepreneurs out there um, is that uh, you know one of the first things you need to do is establish yourself as an expert in the thing that you are trying to do with your business. Um, and you know, fortunately, with the web now and Drupal Planet um, and Twitter, you really just have to start writing and writing well and writing frequently. And um, you know, how many blog posts does it really take to become the world's foremost expert in Drupal for churches and Drupal for youth groups and you know all the sort of things? So um, definitely try to establish yourself or your company as an expert. And you know, the people who need that are starting to come to your website, and you are starting to build a business right there. Um, you know, actually executing the business is um, another step. But um, you know, becoming the expert is something that I think most of us in the room can do, and it's a great first step. And to tag along on, I, I guess on just because this is a, an audience of people interested in products generally, um, I think you know when you find that expertise and you're finding that the, those things, you know, you don't have to build this enormous, huge product and you know distribution and you know SaaS offering in order to start offering products in your expertise. You know, if you're providing services and you have um, you know, a product that can be, you know, a theme or two or, you know, that's, that's appropriate for that specific vertical or that specific group of people. Um, there can be a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, a, a lot of little products out there. I and mean, one of the things that Lullabot does, um, I think, really beautifully with Drupalize Me um, is just, you know, create, they create a lot of content. They create a lot of awesome content. And even just that, those little pieces of content that are available in a subscription form in, um, in their product, you know, it doesn't have to be this enormous, you know, Drupal platform that, to rule them all. It can be, um, these products can actually be very small things that are, that are tools, pieces of content. Um, there's, there's a lot of different things that can be kind of productized in this space without having to build um, an entire system around it. I'm going to drop side back up in my grade. <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, one second. Let's go. Let's go to the mic. Um, good, good, good evening. Good afternoon. There has been a, a recent thing in the community about apps, Drupal apps, right, and features and so on. Um, I've seen it work in in other communities like WordPress and Joomla. Why hasn't the whole idea of selling apps, not modules, but but apps and features and so on, caught on in Drupal community? Who wants it? Hot potato. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just answer part of the question, and I'll let Seth dig in. Okay. Um, I'd say has it really worked for those other communities? Um, maybe it's worked for some people in those communities, um, but, but is it really useful for Joomla um, app or plugin developers, for example, to have to recreate views and rules inside of their e-commerce system um, just to have an e-commerce system that works on top of Joomla. In, in other words, it, it, it's this silo effect where, where if I have an app, why am I going to spend a lot of time making sure it works with everybody else's apps? Um, so so where, where's the, the, the interconnectedness coming from? In, instead, you just be really self-focused, making sure that your stuff works. And, and that, that's really co uh, counter to the, the Drupal way of doing things. And so maybe, maybe, maybe it has worked um, by one metric. Maybe people are making money. Um, but would that same, uh, same thing work inside the Drupal community? I don't think so, uh, because we're much more organic and much more interrelated. Um, just like Drupal Commerce depends on rules and views and the Insta API and C tools, all this stuff that it, you know, it doesn't really make sense for me to try to package up something that I've done and sell it. And, and then again, as we discussed with the GPL, wouldn't somebody just go and redistribute it for free? But, uh, well, yeah, I mean, Ryan said it pretty well. If you look at sort of the, the data on CMS adoption uh, out there, you know, Drupal is sort of trending up, and, and Joomla is really trending down pretty strongly. And I would attribute that in no small part to the sort of fractured nature of, of the Joomla module space. You know, Concrete 5 is an interesting CMS in that it's, it's sort of all the new sexiness out there, and, and it's it enjoying... Uh, a quick rise. I think it's risen like 500% or something. But uh, if you go to the to Concrete Five to their website and you start to think about, you know, building a website, one of the things that's really dissatisfying is you go into their sort of marketplace for modules, and there's like three different modules for you know having Google Fonts on your site, 
and there's all of these other modules for you know in integrating maps. And I think in Drupal, you know, when, when that happens, when there's three modules doing the same thing, the community gets together and says, hey guys, we're all trying to do the same thing. Let's just get together, you know, choose which one we think is the most viable. We'll all become maintainers on this module and then this will go forward uh, as sort of the canonical module for this purpose. And that happens, I think, because modules are free and, and GPL. Um, and I think when, when, you, when you move away from that, uh, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. You get the silo effect that Ryan's referring to. So I didn't add much to what Ryan had already said, but I, I think it's a, you know, restating the point is, is worth it. Yep. I had a similar point I wanted to raise, uh, Doug Van here. Um, I wanted to draw upon the success that uh, Tom McCracken has had at level10.com with their open enterprise distribution, where apps play a central role. When you go to install the Drupal 7 distribution of open enterprise, it asks you what apps you want to install ahead of time. And then once you've installed it, it asks you if you want to install more. And uh, it's doing everything that, that, that features in the features store was, was hoping it would, might do when it grew up uh, years ago, but failed miserably. And it's a, it's a phenomenal thing, but it incorporates the uh, interoperability of modules and context and everything else going on so that we're not building our, we're not rebuilding views, or rebuilding this or, or the other. Um, a, a Drupal Commerce store app would be awesome. It, it'd be among the larger, of course, but there'd be simpler versions and more complex versions. Um, you know, slideshows, et cetera. Uh, you can download the Drupal slideshow module with views, et cetera, but you gotta configure it, which is great, and we will. But as an introductory, you know, having a slideshow app that pre-configures things and sets things up for you, but also has a custom GUI around it that you can configure at the point of installing the app. And then it has, you can go in and edit the view if you want to. It's just regular Drupal after the custom GUI. I think it's awesome, and I'm really hoping, and I'm asking, do you intend on integrating apps into some of your distros, your products? Uh, sorry, can I say one thing real quick? As we, as we start, um, I, I think one thing to distinguish here is that you know the concept, the general concept in the last question of add-ons or plugins or apps, whatever you want to call them, um, and and monetizing them and um, building a, a you know monetizing products through that um, is one concept. Um, and the apps module, <laughs> perhaps not the best named module, is is another concept, um, and and that and it's really um, and what this gentleman was just talking about was was the ability to put um, it to put functionality into distributions in a way that makes it very very simple to install and uninstall and configure, um, and and that's a useful it's a useful tool for for site builders. Um, I, I want to be crystal clear that those are that are, those are kind of two different questions and two different discussions. Um, just because somebody is using the apps module, um, and yes, I'm a little defensive about this because um, we maintain the apps module and we like it quite a lot and we use it in our distributions, um, but it does not mean that they are are, are trying to create a, a large and evil app store. Um, so the, I, I just want to I, I want to make that distinction um, because I do think it's an important um, one to know that um, that that module is um, it, I do I do think it is a useful thing for products and I'm certainly happy to turn it over to to these guys but it doesn't mean that it it's that if they're using it or doesn't not using it doesn't mean that they're you know creating or not creating a, a monetized app store. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? No plans right now. Okay. I mean, I could, then we can consider it. Yeah. 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 Drew? Um, so as service companies, how do you, uh, like, do you have practical strategies for defending your product development time? Do you mm -hmm. uh, prioritizing it, balancing it, because you need income, but you can just talk about those kinds of things. Sure. Um, a part of it is, is size. Uh, we had to get to a certain size before we could create a silo for product development. Um, and and we, we did get there. You know, we got to, we're about 35-ish people and we, we have like a five-person Videola team that's sort of protected um, from our services business. Uh, the, the big work that happened up front was creating the revenue models around Videola and, and sort of exploring how it was ultimately going to be profitable profitable for us and then proving that it was a worthwhile investment because it's very easy to quantify the cost of a certain group of people in a silo working on something per year. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the easy part. Then you've got to say, well, how are we going to be profitable enough so that this can be uh, as profitable or more profitable than our services work? Um, that's the tricky bit, right? That's the business plan. So at, at Lullabot, you know, we've, we've started becoming more disciplined in entertaining product ideas. Uh, and part of that is coming up with, you know, revenue models and spreadsheet form 
for how we're going to ultimately pay for the resources that we're committing to this effort. Um, I think that people have to be siloed. Uh, I think that it's really difficult to um, ask your people to sort of do products work in their own time. Uh, because the truth is, it's like, you know, at Lullabot we had this concept of 20% time, you know, where we, we only schedule people for 30 hours of billable work and the other 10 hours is their time to give back to the community. And, and it's really tough to go ask them to, instead of work on, you know, Nate, instead of working on web form, uh, the module, we need you to work on Videola, the product, you know, it's not gonna make Nate very happy. Um, the only other thing I could say is continuing to push the, the ceiling with your rates. So, you know, it, it, keep raising them a, until there's a lot of complaining. You know, I think there's, there's a, a race to the bottom sometimes to, to sort of get business, uh, you know, to, to grow top line revenue and overall sales uh, by making sales easier to make, which, you know, you can do by dropping your rates. But at the end of the day, that's gonna eat more and more and more of your time. There's a very real cost to that. Um, so keeping your rates high allows you to be, you know, do fewer projects, work less time, and hence maybe have something in the margins to devote to your product. But I think you need to make the case for a product in a services business that it is going to outperform the services that you're doing. Otherwise, stick with the services, you know, because it's, it's more profitable. And at the end of the day, we're, we're, you know, most of us are here to make money. I think, you know, in some form or another, or we wouldn't be here. Great question. Yeah, I mean, the, the revenue model and forecasting is a hugely important part of it. Um, I, I also want to put a plug in for um, the other model, which is let the clients pay for it and build it as you go. Um, it, there's, there's nothing wrong with that model. There's lots right with that model. Um, and to the extent you can pick your clients and pick your jobs so that they push your product forward, I think that's really, you know, a really excellent way to go about it. Yeah, you also get um, a real, like, real-time market testing of your product yep. that way. You know, when you're not siloed and you're testing it in real time all the time with the things that you're building with it that, that are building into, you know, if your actual clients are saying, yes, I will pay you money so that your product has this feature, you can have a pretty good idea that that's a feature that people will pay for. Yeah. So it makes, there's a, a compelling, there are, but there are compelling cases for both, both sides. Let's take the next question. Folks, I'm loving the discussion on, uh, on productizing stuff. If I may, I'd just like to highlight that there's a birds of a feather session this afternoon on entrepreneurship within the Drupal community. It's called Doing Well by Doing Good. If you're interested in entrepreneurship and ideas for, for doing well by doing good, I'd invite you to come and join us. That's this afternoon at 3, 45, room 210. Again, great. thank you for thank letting you. me do the plug. Great. Just a couple more questions here. People need to go, we understand. What's the panel's assessment of the market size and potential for migration uh, consulting products and services? I, I know most you've built a, a business around that, but just how big of a market is that? Um, yeah, so I had a small business before I joined Acquia called Curve um, that was focused on this very problem of migrating data from other systems into Drupal. I never did a market size analysis, so I really can't comment on that part of the question. Um, you know, we were busy, and you know, in, within Acquia, the same team is still busy doing migration, so uh, yes, I think that there's a pretty healthy market there. Um, it's another one of those things where it's riding the Drupal wave, so to the extent that uh, people are moving on to Drupal, they need migration experts. Um, I'd say it's a pretty strong place if you're um, thinking about entering that part of Drupal. I think, yeah, I think it's a, you know, a great place to be. Yeah, I would agree. It's the thing that always takes ten times longer than anybody expects. Um, you know, we did the well, we did with Curve's help the Martha Stewart migration. Um, and, it, and it's still going, you know, the, the, the effort to take all of their content, all of their recipes, books, magazine articles, and put them into one canonical source and then be able to serve that content downstream to their various front-facing web properties was by far, in the end, the largest part of the project. Um, and uh, yeah, migration demand is very high. That's something that we get a lot of requests to do, and there's very few people that specialize in it. So. We'll take one last question. 
Sure. It's a softball question for <laughs> Seth. Uh, can you just tell us about webforms.com or webform.com? Yes, totally. So I, I, I meant to mention webform, but that's she another. She that question. That's a great <laughs> softball. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so webform.com is a new uh, product that uh, Lullabot has launched, um, and it basically is a survey tool to build surveys. Um, Webform is a module that Nate Haug has contributed to Drupal, or contributed the majority of the commits to in Drupal. Pro it's used on most Drupal sites to build forms um, for those sites. And webform.com is a pretty neat uh, GUI that Nate's created around the module. Uh, and it's a hosted service, so you can go on there just like a survey monkey or something, and you can create your own uh, surveys or web forms and host them there. Uh, and at the moment, we're not monetizing it. Right now, it's just a free uh, service out there in the world. But ultimately, I think we'll probably pursue a freemium model, which uh, Mosh already eloquently described. Um, so yeah, thanks, Greg. One more second, Laura. Webform.com. <laughs> any, any other questions? Out you there? don't want to know. Okay. Um, I want to thank our panelists um, today, Ryan and Seth and Mosh, um, and thanks for all your great questions. Thanks.